We went up Vimy Ridge as Albertans and Nova Scotians. We came back down as Canadians. Here. Prior to the war, Canada had a small permanent standing army and a much larger Canadian militia. The Minister of Militia and Defence, Sam Hugh, was ordered by Prime Minister Sir Robert Borden to train and recruit an army for overseas service. At the time, Canada had a regular army of only 3,110 men and a fleeting navy. Although the Chief of the General Staff, Willoughby Grotkins, had been planning for a mass mobilisation of Canadian armed forces for some time, the mobilisation plans were scrapped in favour of mobilising a completely new land force, the Canadian Expeditionary Force, to be based in a number of battalions and reporting to a separate ministry, the Ministry of Overseas Affairs of Canada. Although it was riven with political patronage and a lack of solid core of professional officers and NCOs, 600,000 men and women participated in the war by enlisting as nurses, soldiers and chaplains. In general, general non-white people and those born in enemy nations were not welcome into the military. When black people from Sydney, Nova Scotia volunteered for their services, they were told this is not for you fellas, this is a white man's war. Nonetheless, some segregated units were formed. In 1915, indigenous people, the First Nationers, were allowed to enlist and accepted in the 114th Battalion, as well as other ethnicities such as black, Japanese, Chinese and other races in Canada at the time. In total, about 3,500 indigenous people served within the Canadian forces, but this figure has been disputed. The Canadian Japanese Association in British Columbia put forward a volunteer reserve of 227 men, some of whom would later be admitted into the military. The number 2 construction battalion also included black soldiers from both Canada and the United States, the latter having crossed into Canada in order to participate. The over 1,000 black Canadians who served will continue to be segregated during their tour, both on ships and in camps. A deal, a deal between the Chinese government and the Allies resulted in the enlistment of thousands of Chinese who had formed the Chinese Labour Corps. Mainly poor Chinese men from the north of the country would then be told they would be in non-combat roles. The Canadian government had restricted the arrival of all agents before the outbreak of the war and the CLC were secretly landed in Victoria, British Columbia. They, they were drilled in the old quarantine station at William Head and then secretly shipped across Canada in cattle trucks. The Canadian Corps was formed from the Canadian Expeditionary Forces September 1915, after the arrival of the 2nd Canadian Division in France. The soldiers of the Corps were mostly volunteers as conscription was not implemented until the end of the war. The Corps was then expanded by the addition of the 3rd Canadian Division in December 1915 and the 4th Canadian Division in August 1916. The organisation of the 5th Canadian Division began in February 1917. The organisation of the 5th Canadian Division had begun in February 1916. But it was still not fully formed when it was broken up in February 1918 and its men was new to reinforce other four divisions. Although the courts were within and under the command of the British Army, there was a considerable pressure among the Canadian leaders, especially following the Battle of the Somme, for the corps to fight in a single unit rather than spreading the divisions throughout the whole army, such as Sir Arthur Curry <coughs> and General Bing. Originally commanded by Lieutenant General Sir H. E. A. Helderson until 1916, command was then passed on to Lieutenant General Sir Julian Bing, later Lord Bing of Vimy and then Governor General of Canada. When Bing was promoted to a high command in the summer of 1917, he was succeeded by the commander of the 1st Division, Sir General Arthur W. Curry. Given the Corps' first Canadian commanders, in the later stages of the war, the Canadian Corps was among the most effective and the most respected in the military formation on the Western Front. And of course, let's talk about the Western Front. The CEF saw their first battle in March 1916 in the French town of Nivelle Chapelle. After arriving from Scoulbury Plain in England, the Canadian forces were instructed to prevent the Germans from reinforcing the sector of Nivelle Chapelle. This would allow the British First Army under General Douglas Haig to successfully push through German lines and establish a new Allied front on conquered territory. Although the British weren't able to exploit their advantages due to poor communication, it taught the Canadians that 1. That artillery bombardments were too light to suppress the enemy trenches. 2. That better artillery observation points were necessary. 3. That reserves were too few to follow up success quickly. And 4. Most importantly, the procedure of transmitting information and sending orders in advancing troops was slow and difficult. And with that system of communication, they were too vulnerable. In the first week of April 1915, the soldiers of the 1st Canadian Division were moved to reinforce the salient, where the British and the Allied line pushed into the German line of the concave bend. On the 22nd of April, the Germans sought to eliminate this salient by using poison gas, 
following an intensive artillery barrage that released 160 tons of chlorine gas from cylinders dug into the forward edge of their trenches into a light northwest wind, the first news of chlorine gas in the war actually, as the thick clouds of yellow-green gas drifted over their trenches, the French colonial defences crumbled, and the troops, completely overcome by this terrible weapon, died, broke or fled, leaving a gap of four miles in the Allied lines. The Canadians were the only division that were able to hold the line. In those 48 hours of the battle, the Canadians suffered 6,000 casualties, one man for every three. The next area the Canadians fought, as well as other dominions and colonies, was the Battle of the Somme. The Canadian Corps entered the battle in September where it was tasked to secure the small town of Charles Chaudiet, France. In a major offensive which began on the 15th of September, the Canadian Corps and the extreme left flank of the attack assaulted 2,200 yards of sector west of the village of Charles Chaudiet. By the 11th of November, the 4th Canadian Division finally secured most of the German trenches in Charles Juliet and then rejoined the Canadian Corps at Vimy Ridge. At the Battle of the Somme, there was 24,000 Canadian deaths. It also gave the Canadian units the reputation of a formidable assault force. As British Prime Minister Lloyd George wrote, the Canadians played a part of such distinction that henceforward they would be marked out as shock troops. For the remainder of the war, they were brought along with the head of the assault for one great battle or another. Whenever the Germans found the Canadian corps coming into the line, they always prepared for the worst. For the first time, all four Canadian divisions were to be assembled to operate in combat as a corps. The Canadian divisions were joined by the British 5th Infantry Division and reinforced by artillery, engineer and labour units. The Canadian corps was supported to the north by the 24th British Division of the 1st Corps, which advanced north of Chauches River and by the advancing 17th Corps to the south. The attack began at 5.43am on Easter Monday, the 9th of April 1917, whereupon every artillery piece of the disposal of the Canadian Corps began firing. Light field guns lay down a barrage which advanced in a predetermined increment often 100 yards or 91 meters every three minutes, while medium and heavy houses established a series of standing barrages further ahead against known defensive systems. The 1st, 2nd and 3rd Canadian Division reported reaching and capturing their first objective, the Black Line, by 6.25am. The 4th Canadian Division encountered a deal of trouble and its advance was unable to complete its first objective until some hours later. After a planned pause in which positions were consolidated, the advance resumed. Shortly after 7am, the 1st Canadian Division had taken half of its 2nd objective, the Red Line, and moved into a brigade forward to mount an attack on the remainder. The 2nd Canadian Division reported reaching the Red Line and capturing the town of Les Toulouse at approximately the same time. Yes, Units However, were due to an exposed left flank caused by the failure of the 4th Canadian Division to capture the top of the ridge, the 3rd Canadian Division was forced to stop and establish a divisional defence flank on the north. It was, it was not until 11am that the defending 79th Reservist Division of the Germans mounted a counter-attack, by which time only the 4th Canadian Division had not reached its objective. Three fresh brigades were moved to the Red Line to support the advance, whereupon they would leapfrog existing units occupying the Red Line to advance towards the Blue Line. As a three brigades were moved to the Red Line by 9.30 to support the advance, whereupon they leapfrog existing units occupying the Red Line to advance towards the Blue Line. At approximately 11am, the Blue Line, including Hill 135 and the town of Chalus, had been captured. The advance briefly halted, the artillery barrage remaining stationary for 90 minutes to give troops time to consolidate the Blue Line and to bring supporting machine guns forward. Shortly before 1pm, the advance resumed to the Brown Line, beginning to secure around 2pm. By this point, only the northern half of Hill 145, the Pimple, a fortified high point of Gavinchy El Gohel, remained under German control. Fresh troops, the Scottish actually, finally forced the remaining German troops from the northern half of the Hill 145 at around 3.15pm and by the nightfall of the 10th of April, the only objective not yet achieved was the capture of the Pimple, supporting a significant amount of artillery under 24th Division of the 1st Corps to the north. The 10th Canadian Brigade attacked a hastily entrenched German troop and captured the Pimple on the 12th of April, bringing an end to the battle. By the nightfall of the 12th of April 1917, the Canadian Corps was in firm control of the ridge. The four divisions of the CEF were transferred to Ypsilia and tasked with making additional advances in Passchendaele. The Canadian Corps relieved the 2nd Anzac Corps on the 18th of October from their positions along the valley between Gavin Salfell Ridge and the heights of Passchendaele. 
The Canadian Corps operations were to be executed in a series of three attacks with limited objectives and delivered in an interval of three or more days. As the Canadian Corps positions were directly south of the inter-army boundaries between the British 5th Army and the 2nd Army, the British 5th Army would mount subsidiary operations on the Canadian Corps' left flank, while the 1st Anzac Corps would advance to protect the right flank. The first stage began in the morning of the 26th of October. The 3rd Canadian Division was assigned the north flank which included the shortly rising grounds of the Belleville Spurs, south of the Reckenbeck Creek. The 4th okay. Canadian Division would take the Decline Corps which was straddled by the Yeats Rollers Railway. The 3rd Canadian Division captured the Wolf Corps and secured its objective line, but was ultimately forced to drop a defensive flank to line up with the British flank of the British 5th Army. The 4th Canadian Division initially captured all its objectives but gradually retreated from the Decline Corps due to the German counterattacks and miscommunication between the Canadians and Australian units in the south. The second stage began on the 30th of October and was intended to capture the positions not captured in the previous stage and gain a base of the final assault on Passchendaele. The, the southern flank would capture the strongly held Crest Farm while the northern flank would capture the hamlet of Mel Chali, which was also in Grangberg area near the Canadian Corps' northern boundaries. The southern flank quickly captured Crest Farm and began sending patrols beyond its objective lines into Passchendaele itself. The 3rd Canadian Division captured Vapour Farm on the Corps boundary, formed farms on the West Michelet and the crossroads at Michelet, but remained short of its objective lines. Three consecutive rainless days between the 3rd and the 5th of November aided logistical preparations and reorganizations of the troops for the next stage. The third stage, the last stage, began on the morning of the 6th of November with the 1st and 2nd Canadian Divisions having taken over the front relieving the 3rd and 4th Canadian Divisions respectively. Less than three hours after the start of the assault, many units had reached their final objective lines and the town of Passchendaele had been captured. A successful action to gain the remaining high ground north of the village of the vicinity of Hill 52 was launched on the 11th of November. This attack on the 11th of November brought to an end the long drawn out 3rd Battle of Yips. The 2nd Battle of Passchendaele cost the Canadian Corps 15,654 casualties with over 4,000 dead in 16 days of fighting alone. In the 100 days offensive they would not do much but they would be the spearhead of the British and Canadian forces and of course the French as well as they would actually march into the city of Mons and it would become the black day for the German army but of course we will talk about the 100 days offensive with the Americans but for now the cultural impact of the first world war and the Canadian identity was shaped at the Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele itself. There was a general agreement that in the early 20th century most English speaking Canadians, well not the Quebecans, we'll get to them in another episode, saw no conflict between their identities such as British subjects and their identities as Canadians, such with the Anzacs. In fact, the British world or British Empire identity was a key part of the Canadian identity up till that point. Many Canadians defined their country as part of North America that own allegiance to the British Crown. <coughs> in World War I, Neve Chapelle was the birth of the Canadian Corps, Vimy Ridge was the birth of the Canadian nation, and the Battle of Passchendaele was the birth of the Canadian identity and the solidification of the Canadian nation. Even in World War II, it was the most effective fighting force in the British Army thus far, and of course the Canadians were served throughout other campaigns as well such as the Palestine, Gallipoli, and even it would go as far into the Balkans. But that's a story for another day, and the War of 1812 had proved Canada's might, and of course even though the British led them to victory, the Canadians will be and will always be a formidable fighting force. Alright guys, thank you for watching. Canadian accent was on point A. I really like it, but about the Canadian accent, it was very hard for me to do. But I managed to get through it, and of course, I'm going to drink some maple syrup, of course bathe in maple leaves, and drink some Tim Hortons for dinner. Anyway, hope you enjoyed, hope you learned something about Canada. The most formidable fighting force of World War One, after the Gurkhas of course the most effective white people of World War One, maybe. I don't know, politically incorrect, maybe. But I hope all you person persons learn something, and I'm really trying to be politically correct as the new Canada is the way forward. So I hope you person persons learn something today, and I hope I did not, um, you know, culturally appropriate Canada, but um, the First Nationers are tomorrow, and hopefully I don't really appropriate their land. So look forward to that one. Oh Canada, oh Canada. Where have you gone? Alright, learn something. Enjoy. This is like the third time I'm doing this. 
Saskatchewan is best province of Canada. Changed my mind. I forgot to mention notable Canadians to give a shout out to because you know, I'm basically copying every other channel so why not copy Geography Hub with their notable um, descendants of a country or notable people that were born in the country. And of course, Jamie, streamer, best guy, Canadian A, he's the best one. And JJ, not Quintel, Quintillion, or J his name is JJ, I can't remember his full name. Politician, very curly hair, had a mustache. Pretty, uh, pretty awkward, but um, Shave JJ is pretty cool. No homo, of course, but you know, I'm not trying to be a bigot or anything. Canada is number one. Canada is most liberal. Canada is always right. Canada, God bless. Anyway, hope you learned something, and uh, yeah, other, can notable, other notable Canadians would probably be Shay. Pretty dank memer. Pretty bad. Pretty bad memer. And um, I think that's it. Alright, Terry as well. Yeah, Terry. Best. She's the best. She's the best. Albertan. She's Albertan for life. Anyway, hope you learned something. Hopefully, if I go to Canada, because Canada's right up the road. Um, literally. Not, not literally, but Canada is right there. So if we do something, we could probably copy again and do on the road. I will go to some museums or check out some weapons and even go fire them if I have permission to fire them because I never fire a personal defense weapon in my life or a weapon in general. So. Hopefully that would be cool. Anyway, hope you learned something. And this outro shouldn't be two minutes, but it is. Anyway, learn something yet again for the last time. No other notable Canadians, but Canadians, enjoy. First Nationers, enjoy this and your episode as well. But, um, learn something.